We're entering a new year, and it's time to get back into the garden. Even though it's winter, there's still plenty to do. But where do you start? We have our garden expert, Jan McNeilan, back with us to give us a starting point with a whole bunch of tips. It's all coming up next on Garden Time. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon. At Capital Subaru, we value your time, whether you're here for service or working with our amazing sales team. Everything is right here for your convenience. We offer a great selection of Subarus, an industry-leading service center that keeps you moving, and so much more. And right now, during the Subaru Share the Love event, Subaru will donate $250 for every new Subaru vehicle sold or leased from November 17th through January 3rd. Feel great about your new Subaru and be a part of something special this holiday season. It's always your time at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. We're based in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in a Zone 8 region. This zone deals with plants that can survive in 10 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. I'm producer Jeff Gustin with your hosts Judy Alaruzzo and Ryan Seeley. Welcome to Garden Time, and today we are talking about winter tips with Jan McNeilan, a retired OSU extension agent. And Jan's been with us before, and she brought us a book, okay? So <laughs> her and her husband, Ray, they wrote a, um, wrote a book with some garden tips on it, and, or in it, and this was one of the copies. It was never published, right? I mean, Not so this. people can just call you and you will send them? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not this version. Okay. But All it's right. just, we did it by the month suggesting. We called it What to Do, and this was What to Do 2 or 3, I don't know. Right. But we never, this one never got published. And OSU Extension has a calendar on yeah. their website, um, or we're talking about Oregon State University Extension. And so if you go to their website, you can, the Extension website, you can actually connect with that. Right. So, um, so today we're going to go through Jan's book, and um, <laughs> we're going to answer uh, a few things and give you some tips about winter um, chores you can do in your garden. Um, so... Who wants to start on chapter one? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll die for it. How many one. hours do we have? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have an hour today, so we can go. Unfortunately, you know, the only place you're going to find this information, since it's unpublished, is you have to listen to our podcast. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's listen true. to Jan. So, Jan, there's all sorts of things we can be doing or should be doing in our yard right now. Some we should be doing, and some that we shouldn't be yeah. doing. So it's kind of one of those transitional time times a year, but. You know, a lot, of, a lot of us have, you know, gardening, we have fruit trees and berry plants and things that we need to get ready now for next spring. So we make sure that we have, have the fruit. So what are, what are some of the things that we need to do this time of year in our, for those that have like a small orchard or berry plants? Sure. Uh, well, even though it, they're not qu completely dormant yet, we always talk about fruit trees and dormancy and that's when you prune them. I already pruned mine because uh, they're not going to, they're not going to shoot any growth now. Uh, but January, February is usually when you want to prune uh, your fruit trees and, uh, and try to take out all those suckers that come from the year before when you pruned your fruit trees. And there's also, you can do work on cane berries and grapes and all sorts of other things. So. Is it, you know, you say January, February, is it, you know, if we've already, you said you've already done it. So is there, you know, harm that you could be doing to the plant by pruning if it still too has early leaf, versus... Yeah, if it still has leaves on it, I would, I would wait till it's cold enough where all the leaves have dropped and, and it is going into dormancy at that point. But yeah. it won't shoot any new growth when it's this cold. And then there's, you know, different types of trees. You know, people have apples and pears and peaches and all that. Is there different pruning that goes along with certain, certain types of trees? So, some. It's, the key is really learning what a fruit spur looks like on whatever tree you have. So if it's an apple, you have to learn what an apple spur looks like that will bear fruit the following year so that you can leave that behind. Uh, so depending on what you have, figure out what the spurs look like. And then there's some, there's some really good publications that OSU has um, for pruning or rejuvenating, a, say, an apple tree that hasn't been touched in a long time and how to do it to take a third, a third, a third out over a three-year period right. instead of whack it. I did that once. Uh, I just got up in an apple tree that my dad used to prune and then I didn't for a long time and I got a chainsaw and just went up there and took everything out that was going <laughs> straight up. Well, oh. yeah, the following yeah. years it really shot up. And so if yeah. you do it 
yeah, it, in time over, say, a three-year period, then you can rejuvenate that tree and not have quite so much work. And for some people that don't know, the homeowners, uh, a spur is just, a, it's almost like a you have leaf spurs and you have fruiting spurs. And right. they look different. They do. But you have to look closely mm -hmm. at them. Um, the fruiting spur looks more like a wrinkled drum, I guess I could say. Not knowing that that's exactly right, but co close enough. The leaf spur does look different. Yeah. So you, knowing the difference is going to make a... And that's easy enough to find pictures yeah, of. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. There's yeah. some really good books, too, um, on pruning and training all sorts of plants. Yeah, uh, we've we've what, done articles, too, on, yes. on garden time right. in the past. That right. You can go back through our archives and sure. find, find sure. some of those, too. I think even going to your local independent garden center, there's usually experts there. You can, if you're really stuck, and they can maybe walk you through it. They have trees. Maybe they can show you what, right. what that is right. and give you some tips that way, too. Sure. And you had mentioned, uh, you know, cutting out the dead part. And you have in here removing dead cadence from berries. And that's a similar thing? Or do you should be doing that with a lot well, of your depend, food? Well, depending on what kind of berries you have. If you have fall-bearing berries or ever-bearing, per se, um, or uh, summer-bearing, that just the right now, actually, usually I wait till spring, and this year we did it already, took out everything that died back, isn't going to produce again. Uh, there's fresh canes that came, and then the, at the tips of those branches, uh, they produced a fall crop, not a big one, but a fall crop. So if you get too excited about pruning, you may prune off your fall berries. Oh, yeah. We're just like, oh, I'll make them all the same level. Well, not. Uh, it doesn't work so well that way. But uh, so I, I've pruned out all of the dead canes from this last season, left the other canes that are going to be for this coming season, and did that with, uh, with the blackberries, the trailing blackberries as well. And I haven't done grapes yet, but um, grapes can be done any time mm -hmm. now. And a lot of times if you've done it, if, you, if it's becoming the first part of March or early April and you haven't pruned your grapes, you can prune them. It, they're they're going to weep and they're not bleeding. They're not going to die. Uh, that They're just pumping water from the soil. And so you still can prune them, but it's better to do them in like February. And you'll see more of that fluid on a warmer day mm -hmm. as that, yeah. pump, that yeah. plant is pumping As it gets more. warmer, they'll pump more. I may have jumped ahead. Mm. And, uh, no, did you? no, I was going to say with grapes, people don't realize how far you go back with those. Oh, yeah. Well, and there's so, different systems, mm -hmm, too. That is true. Yep. Yeah. And there's more information online, too, for that. Too. Absolutely. There's, there's uh, all sorts of uh, pruning and uh, trellising information on the Extension uh, website. And for people that aren't here, it's on their on their extension for their state too. I would yeah, think. Yeah, uh, generally, sure. it's all sure. the, they get that uh, information, and that's uh, research based <clears throat> information. So it's not, you know, somebody made up something at home. Right. Hey, right. this worked for me. Yeah, uh, the researchers actually do this at research stations, and they right. do different varieties, so they know when they publish something that there's a there's some scientific backing to that. I um, had a friend in Florida call me not too long ago and say, I want to I want to grow vegetables along my carport. Well, of course, it's really hot. And, and I said, you know, I grow vegetables, but not in Florida. I said, call your local county extension agent and mm -hmm. uh, and get local information. So the timing will be different, too. You're going to want to plant during the coolest season you have, not the warmest. Right. Like we wait right. till it warms up. Well, I'd wait till it <laughs> cooled down if I were in Florida. So uh, every county in every state has a land grant. Uh, extension service. Excellent, excellent. You know, um, so, so go, go ahead, ahead hop in. So, you know, just to jump back in on kind of the the pruning of our, our fruit trees and you know removing some of the canes and getting our berries things. Are there other things that we need to be looking out for or doing? You know, we heard dormant spray often. Is you know what is a dormant spray and what is that doing and when should we be be doing that? Well, dormant sprays can can smother insects like an oil base and a horticultural oil can smother insect eggs that are there for the following year. I guess what I would do, I don't spray, but um, I would look and see if there's damage on your plants. If, if so, what is it? What's it from? Um, do you have insects in your um, apple trees? Do you have worms in your grapes? If you don't, 
then you may not need the spray. Right. Or if you don't mind having those things. Or if you don't, <laughs> right, right. A little extra protein. Right, yeah. right. Um, so, I, you know, there's bores that get into raspberries and they bore right at the, at the base of the cane and the cane will just die out uh, and you won't know why unless you're looking really closely. So if you put a dormant spray on, it isn't necessarily going to help. So you have to really know what your problems are or what, or what the plants that you have are susceptible to and then decide what kinds of uh, off-season spraying you might be able to do. A lot of people bring that up. What can I do to lessen my pests going into the summer? And a lot of times people say, well, there's nothing I can do. It's the winter. The cold is going to kill them. That's not necessarily true. Mm -mm. But like baiting for slugs, um, if you have a slug problem, um, things like that, there are still things that you can do in the winter time, and dormant spraying is one of those. Sure, and then in the case of slugs, the fall is the best time because every one of those slugs you see can lay up to 100 eggs. Mm. So that would be the time to get them instead of spring when they're already there. Right. Uh, so timing is everything, too, as far as control. Right. Uh, there's, it's just really with anything, insecticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, whatever, you just first you need to know what you may be susceptible to uh, and th the particular plants you have and then figure out what to do and when. Excellent. Uh, next on the list we had um, pruning blueberries and you had mentioned the one-third, one-third, one-third and this is a plant that really responds well to that one-third, one-third, one-third. It does. Uh, you take the oldest, the one-third of the oldest canes right down to the ground because what, because blueberries um, fruit on new wood. So you're trying to not keep that old wood, you're trying to make new wood. And that's the best way to keep, I've got some really big old blueberry bushes and that's what we've done to them every year. They also can really benefit from, from a mulch and, and they really do take more water than, uh, at least in the home garden, you're able to water them a little more. They have really shallow roofs, and that's yeah. probably why the yeah. mulch is so good for them. Yeah. It keeps them yeah. nice and cool and moist. Well, they like the cellulose the, ah. um, part that of texture. mulches uh, that help, too. I was told recently, which I never even thought about, uh, from uh, a well-known arborist here in the city, um, that uh, I kept all the chips from the work that I had done, and he said, that grand fir can really use those. Just spread them out in oh, the root wow. zone, and they'll like the cellulose mm -hmm. that's there. Mm. Because grand firs and, and Douglas firs have had a real tough time in the last few years with the dry soils. Mm. So those mulches do more than just keep the water in. There's more mm -hmm. to it. I'm more interested. Because you'll see like a lot of the big commercial blueberry farms are putting sawdust. Yeah. On yeah. the, um, mm -hmm. You don't think of a sawdust as, as a mulch. Is there, and you kind of only see that on blueberry plants. Is there something that the blueberries like about the sawdust? That... Well, the blueberries can take that in better than a lot of other fruit trees because, or fruit, fruiting plants, um, because they, uh, they have a more fibrous root, uh, more of a root system than any kind of berries or grapes or anything do. And it does keep the water in, yeah, but they do benefit from the breakdown of that. The sawdust breaks down faster than bark chips do, right. and so you're getting some uh, nitrogen there and some cellulose there that um, that can help the plants. Excellent. Judy, you have a... Oh, I was just going to um, go on to the next topic. I think that bulbs are a fun topic to talk about <laughs> because I have a, a bag of tulip bulbs that never got in the ground. And so I'm so glad we're talking about this because you feel guilty. You buy oh, them sure. and sure. then they just sit and then they rot because you didn't get them in the ground. So what else can we do? You know, it's already, you know, late um, and I don't really want to be out there digging. So well, guess what? You need to. <laughs> so is they're not going to do you any good in the bag no, or inside. You can the easiest thing, and this is what I did one year when I had I love a bunch, your idea, yeah. is that I just I potted them up. Yeah, and then I I put them outside. You do, you can't. They it doesn't cold. help to yeah. keep them inside. <laughs> uh, I potted them up, and then I put mulch over the top of them. 
outside the leaves that I use that are like gold to me. Um, and so that's what, I, that's what I did. And then what's fun about that is that when they start to bloom and start to shoot some green growth, um, you can move them around and say, oh, I have these blooming tulips on my front porch. And when they're done, you can bring in something else. Um, so that's what I've done. No, it, I love that idea. I mean, you, but yeah. the soil right now, it's not frozen solid here. Other places it is. No, that's true. That um, is true. But here it's not. And as long as you can dig in the soil, you can plant them. So yep. is that true it's for or, or anywhere around the country? Yeah, I mean, if, 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 if it's if not frozen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're not because it's the best way. Uh, it's the best way to keep them going because when you buy bulbs, they're already ready to flower. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to fertilize them to get them to flower. They're, they're already there and they're strong enough to flower for the next season. And I love that in pots because you don't have that ugly foliage in your flower beds. Right. So right. you put them in the pot, they're beautiful, and then you take them out and you put them in the back by the compost bin or somewhere so that they can die down right. and energize that bulb for the next year. Right. And right. you don't have to worry about covering that foliage. The only thing, the caution is when I put all these leaves over <laughs> these pots, you, as it starts to warm up, you need to take the leaves off. If not, you're going to have daffodils that look like bleached asparagus yes. <laughs> because there's no chlorophyll right. at all. So you have to pull it off so that those plants can, and it takes them, what, three days and they're green. To get green, right. Yeah. yeah. And going forward with that, though, sometimes in the middle of winter time, we get these warm days and you can start seeing their little noses come up and the foliage comes up and then it gets really cold and people get so nervous about, oh no, they're not going to bloom, they're going to be dead. And so what, what about that? Should we worry? No. <laughs> we worry so much, don't we? <laughs> the, uh, the flower itself is not where the foliage is. The flower is deep inside the soil still. What's coming up are the leaves or the, gr the green foliage. So, and I have seen, I've seen daffodils coated with ice <laughs> and snow or whatever, and they melt and look like they never had a, a cold day. So it, anything, I've got uh, some native trilliums that always come up the end of January. Whoa. Wow. And they come up about three inches and then they just sit there. <laughs> and they come up and they bloom every year by April. But, you know, I know they're going to be fine, so I don't worry about them. You don't have to mulch them or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Plants are kind of smart yeah. and we just Way smarter that. than us, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Usually I have my crocus always up and yeah, I have, yeah, of have snow on top of them. Right. It's, it's kind of pretty looking. It is pretty. Know, but they yeah. come back year after year. And they yeah, I have snowdrops and snow I drops. love them. Mm -hmm. they, they do really well and spread like crazy. Yep. Uh, what's next on our list? Oh, sharpening tools and repairing tools. I think that sometimes we just forget about it. Things get thrown into the, into the shed or into the basement and they're dirty and rusty, rusty <laughs> and dull. Yeah. And so really we need to work on that. <laughs> That's yeah. a good oh, I think we all do. I mean, you see this, get a bucket of sand and put oil in it and put your yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe. Um, and then they rust and, and then they're not usable. But you can clean up really horribly rusty tools can be done. Mm -hmm. They're at many farmers markets. Uh, there are uh, booths that actually sharpen tools. Mm -hmm. There's one at Hillsdale Farmers Market I know on Sundays and he sharpens knives and tools and everything too. But if you know somebody that knows how to use a grinder, you can do it yourself. Yeah, the key um, is is knowing which edges to grind yeah, because right. a bypass pruner has a blade that goes past essentially um, uh, another hard edge. Right. Only the bypass part needs to be sharpened right. and only on one side. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they think, well, it's like a kitchen knife or something. Yeah. I have to sharpen both sides. Yeah. You don't. No. Know your tool, yeah. know which needs to be sharpened. Yeah. Speaking of which tools, I this year I got myself a handheld battery charged chainsaw. So cool. <laughs> it, it only has a blade that's about six, eight inches. So I'm not going to get in too much trouble with big stuff. Mm -hmm. But I surely can clean up the smaller stuff. And to me, to me, I, uh, I had one and the guy that pruned my uh, fruit trees for me, I loaned it to him and he immediately ordered one that <laughs> night. Um, there, there are some tools that we can 
have that make our job a lot easier. We got one a couple of years ago. We did a story with Wayne uh, Sutton cool. from Steel Tools, and he had one of those, and they were back ordered. Oh, and yeah. we met him. It was like Lungs. doing a, 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 a drug deal in a parking lot. <laughs> you know, we, we met him, and he had he had one that he bought for us because he couldn't get one through the company. He actually had to, on his rounds, oh. buy one for oh, us. Wow. It is it is better than a hot knife through butter. I tell Absolutely. you, it is wow. wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, but once again, you know, just knowing how to take care of the tools, even the electric, you know, sure, the electric sure. tools mm -hmm. that Absolutely. you have. So. Yeah. And I know you went electric a couple of years ago. I went electric too, and yeah. actually that handheld chainsaw. Yeah. I bought one for my parents last year for Christmas. Yeah. And, and you and borrow it, is, it back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is their favorite favorite tool. They use it all the time. Yeah. Right. And the, I've got two big trees that have come down in the last six months. Um, and I have to have some help with the big parts of the trunk, but now I can I can mm -hmm. cut back a lot of the branches and save myself a little money. Uh, when it comes to that, and then also make it small enough that I can use it in my wood stove. Oh, that's good. Sure. And that's the new trend about electric tools. I keep on reading about it. Everybody's going, getting rid of the gas-powered ones and going more green, and they're lighter. They're easier to use. Very much so. And so they're, they're really something to add to your, your toolbox. And they're cordless. I mean, yes. I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've hit cords many yeah. times. <laughs> my my hand clippers have chopped off the edge yeah. of that, that cord many a time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what all that electrical tape yep. is for. <laughs> for sure. So I've done a little bit of research on those. I've been doing stories in the past. And the batteries are not interchangeable between different models. No. So if you buy uh, a steel tool or a you know, Makita tool or whatever the, the company is, know that you're going to be buying all the similar tools in that line from that same company. Right. And so do your research well, know the tools you want, and then, you know, mm -hmm. purchase accordingly. Because even though the battery will be interchangeable within those that product line, mm -hmm. it won't go to all your other electric stuff. So like, like switching phones or anything. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. right. It yeah. just doesn't yeah. go. Yeah. So uh, what's next? We have birds. We were talking about our feathered friends and, and wildlife in general, but you have here a couple of really good ideas for people that love bringing birds into their, into their gardens. First one, cleaning. Must be me. Yeah, go uh, cleaning uh, bird yeah, boxes. Well, keeping them clean, and that's not, it's kind of like sharpening tools. Yeah, you're um, right. It's like I gotta do this, and then I don't. Um, but I actually, I do most of the time keep those feeders and nesting boxes clean with, uh, Clean them out when the birds aren't in there, uh, but do some observation because sometimes birds use those in the winter just for protection, mm -hmm. not necessarily nesting, but protection. Anyway, to clean that, clean those out, uh, and and look if you're going to supply some nesting material, make sure that it. Talk to Audubon Society or a bird shop of some kind or whatever, because I. I made the mistake of thinking, whoa, this lint from the dryer is cool, I'll mm -hmm. just put that out, and they use it, but evidently the softeners we use and the, oh, that sure. aren't, that birds, it's not good for them. So I don't do that anymore. I heard polyester is not the best friend of <laughs> <so laughs> the bird. <laughs> Natural exactly. fiber. <laughs> but anyway, keep them cleaned out, keep your, your feeders clean. Um, I, I'm trying, I love, I know, you're not going to like this, I love squirrels, you guys know that, <laughs> um, but I don't want to feed them all the stuff I feed for the songbirds. So I had these squirrel-proof feeders, um, which is a misnomer, uh, <laughs> and so I got another, so they, they ate the inside off to get okay. in. And then I got another one, and in one day, that one was gone. It, it wow. didn't work anymore one day. And so this time, I got the kind that if the squirrel touches it, it closes it. Oh, and so it. it's working pretty well. Um, and then I'm, I think my... My bill for the bird seed won't be quite as <laughs> quite as bad. Um, so, and then in the case of hummingbirds, we have the the rufous hummingbirds. Uh, they migrate, so they're gone um, early fa uh, fall. Uh, but the annas stay. So you're going to see hummingbirds all winter long. Keep in mind that if it's freezing out there, so is your juice. Mm -hmm. So there's heated feeders. There's feeders you can, you can put up. 
a, uh, a light on one to keep it warm enough so that it won't freeze. With me, I have two, and I switch them out, have one defrosted and one ready to go. And um, so that's what I do with the hummingbirds. But either either don't feed them, or if you do feed them, keep up with it. And you yeah. can plant a mahonia. Is your, is your charity blooming now, your mahonia? It is. I was watching. <laughs> uh, I have a mahonia lamarifolia, which is like a giant Oregon grape um, that's actually, what, 10 it's feet huge, tall? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and blooms with spiky yellow flowers. And it starts to bloom end of November, early December. And the hummingbirds were out there this morning feeding off of yeah. it. So it seems weird that that time of year is, you can plant something that they can feed off of. Yeah, and uh, most of the Mahonias are winter bloomers. I have a small yeah. one called Soft Caress, and yeah. it's been in bloom like since November, yeah. so early yeah. November. So Pretty amazing. Um, it's kind of fun, you know, that they, they're still going to nectar flowers too. Well, what I like about it too is that then indeed it puts out the blue berries, mm -hmm. and the, berry, the birds feed off and strip out the berries every year too. So it's a, it's a multiple uh, feeder for birds. That's true, yeah. yeah. And I, and just Cleaning them gets rid of that disease. I know right. that, um, last year they, uh, local Audubon, I think, re requested that people bring Take in their down. feeders yeah. in because that's where all the birds go and that's where yeah. the disease mm -hmm. spreads. So yeah. anytime you go out and refill it, clean, clean it up, it. Yeah. disinfect it, yeah. put it back out. So um, what's next, Judy? Um, let's see. Oh, allium crops. There's more to plant, not just tulip bulbs and daffodil bulbs there and are. even vegetables. Well, it, yeah, actually there's some... Winter vegetables that, that can, you know, kale will last till the, after the hardest freeze. And there's other, other crops that do as well. And if you wanted to um, build yourself a little hoop house or something over it, it'll even last longer. So there's lots of things you can do there. I, I planted garlic finally uh, this year. And uh, I planted it deep enough, but not too deep. And it was already coming up. So that's okay. good, but I, now it's stopped because it's cold enough, like a bulb stops mm -hmm. too. Uh, so, and alliums are, it's a big, it's a big uh, group of plants, but the, the big ones with uh, uh, big flowers oh, on them are just right. gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have some of those in one of the raised bits as well. Excellent, excellent. So um, we're going to take a break now um, and listen to a message from Capital Subaru. And when we get back, we will talk about, we haven't even gone down a third of the page. <laughs> it's out of like 10 pages. Um, but uh, when we come back, we'll give you some more tips to do in the winter garden. We'll be right back. Start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else in Oregon. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. And right now, during the Subaru Share the Love event, Subaru will donate $250 for every new Subaru vehicle sold or leased from November 17th through January 3rd. Feel great about your new Subaru and be a part of something special this holiday season. Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. And welcome back to Garden Time. And we're here with Jan McNeilan, retired OSU, Oregon State University Extension agent. And we're talking about winter tips for the garden. And I uh, wanted to remind people, because you had mentioned getting your knife sharpened at a local uh, farmer's market. Um, we are here in the Pacific Northwest. We're specifically around the Portland uh, metro area, Portland, Oregon. Though a lot of the things we talk about, like you said, you can go to your local extension mm -hmm. agency um, you, know, you can find out the local farmer's market. You can find knife sharpening, that kind of stuff, in your local community. Just do a little string search. But it, we talked about, during the break, about zones. And I have to change. I mentioned in the open of the show that we're a zone 7. We're no longer a zone 7. We are a zone 8, which a. means yeah. uh, 8A. which no, means B. We're, Actually, we're 8B. Yeah, B. Um, so we're a little warmer. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned that um, uh, in Bend, which is just right across the Cascades, a couple hours away, they're a zone six or six. six. Yeah, they're six A. Yeah. And 
uh, they get much colder temperatures, things that we can plant here, they can't plant there. But as you mentioned, um, it also is a lot drier climate. Yeah, much so the drier. zone has absolutely nothing to do with the amount of rainfall. No, it's, it's just only based the on temp temperature. It's the temperature at which a plant will survive, not necessarily thrive, but survive. <laughs> And so that's what the USDA zones are based on, is, is the lowest temperature a plant uh, will take. And let me think. Here. And I'm going to put a chart up on the screen for the Oregon area, but the USDA has zones for across the entire United States. Right. So you can uh, go to their website and uh, you can look that up. The interesting thing about that is, is that's, that's not only about plant surviving. That's about people surviving because I tell you what, zone six, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> what if you go skiing? Zone okay. eight is pushing it. <laughs> As an example, uh, the USDA zone B uh, that plants will take down to 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit so that's is an, the lowest temperature they'll survive. That's an 8B? That's an 8B. Okay. So that's Portland Metro. Yeah. yeah. So uh, be, be aware of that. And when we talk about plants, that's what we're talking about zone-wise. Um, so, Ryan, we have a couple other um, uh, things from the chapter right. one. So, <laughs> as, as we're, page one. <laughs> you know, as, as, so we're moving out, outdoors and, you know, and looking at zones, and some of us are still warmer, but a lot of us in the country get snow mm -hmm. in, in the wintertime. And there's sure. some things that we kind of need to prepare for and, and you know, get our yards ready for. So when we do have a snow event, you know, here in the Portland area, we may or may not get snow every year, but sometimes we do. We can get, you know, several inches at a time, and it tends to be real wet, heavy snow, mm -hmm. which can do some harm and some damage to some plants if we don't kind of prepare those, you know, like arborvita hedges yeah. come, come to mind up here that you know, we've had those winters where you get a lot of wet, heavy <laughs> snow, and it just kind of sprawls them all open, and they don't seem to bounce back very well after that snow melts. So what are, what are some tricks that we can do to, well, you know, Well, the first thing to know is that snow is an insulator. So we used to get calls like, do I need to wrap my rhododendron with an electric blanket, or what do I need to do? <laughs> Um, and the idea is that first it's an insulator. It's not, it's not going to kill your plants, especially if you're in this zone we're talking right. about. It's not going to kill the plants. If it's wet and heavy, like it was last April here, and trees already had leafed out, I lost a huge old plum tree. Um, the, and it was just because they had so much surface to catch that wet snow. So there's a lot of, some things you can't, I couldn't have done anything. It was a 70 year old tree. Right. So I couldn't have done anything there. But if something's smaller and it's starting to really bend, you can gently shake it. Most people whack them with a, balloon, or with a broom and then uh, you can break branches that way. Right. So keep in mind that you're not there to get all the snow off, just the worst weight and just jiggle it a little bit and, and that it'll come off. But otherwise, there's not a lot you're going to do about it. Right, because we've done it be before. I've talked about it where, you know, you start knocking the snow up off the top and it just keeps yeah. dumping well, down and pretty careful. soon you have right. a lot of snow that's falling down on right. those lower branches where you're going exactly. you know, to exactly. start snapping some so things keep off. In so keep in mind that it's an insulator first and that if it does, if it's a super wet snow, then you can do some shaking, but I wouldn't whack it with anything because you're going to break branches. Well, you brought up uh, the point too, Ryan. Um, we've talked about this before, that when you get the, that cold weather, your plants that are out in your landscape, if they haven't, if you haven't had a rain in a while, that uh, cold winter weather, the cold winds can desiccate those leaves, and you could have some problems with those plants. So, you know, even though. It can get cold and it's the winter and we get rain sometimes it's good to still check on those plants to make sure that they're hydrated enough especially under your eaves to, well under you know, eaves for sure yeah i mean uh, there's no rain is going to get under there so if you're trying to have something grow just keep put it on your calendar or something to, every few weeks or once a month or something go out and uh, and get some water on those plants that are sh that are protected because that it's those are even though you think they're up against the house and protected, they still need to get water. So you right, that before, yeah, so. It, yeah, okay. yeah. Because I've I've pulled a lot of my my big containers up up where the house, so I can still enjoy them. But like you said, they're not getting the rain on. Right. right. And you know, you think it's like okay, these gray rainy days for weeks on end, you kind of forget about it. 
for that, sure. You know, but they're they're still thirsty. Yeah. Well, I push all my <clears throat> pots, as we've said many times and shown many times, uh, against the south facing wall, uh, and there's very little eave there, and most of it gets plenty of rain, so I don't have to think about it too much. That helps. I did some transplanting and new new um, plant plantings this fall, so I should probably look at those too if we're really dry. Um, going into like a dry stretch or a you know dry cold stretch to make sure they get extra water. If they're outside and exposed to soil, they're probably okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if if that's what you have to do that day, then <laughs> <laughs> put it on your list. I just yeah, worry I sometimes because the root balls are small, but you don't have to necessarily worry about no, those. No, I, I mean poke your finger down and feel, you can feel the moisture in the soil. And if you can feel moisture, it's high enough on that root ball that it's fine. fine. Mm -hmm. Now there's some sprays, you know, I've seen on the market that you can spray if you're worried about, you know, foliage that's going to be evaporating all the moisture out of them that you can spray like a wilt proof or other anti-transparents that kind of seal in the moisture. Thoughts on I don't know how much those. science there is behind that. My husband used to say, "What the transplant uh, anti uh, I want to say antiperspirant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we know what you mean. Anti, anti <laughs> transpir <laughs> transpiration. Um, what you're really doing is putting you're mixing it with water. Yeah. And you're putting water on it. Mm. So if it's a spray, a light spray, I I'm not sure." that it works. I'm not going to say it does. It's just yeah. another product. <laughs> so Ryan, you had brought up something in, during the break too. It wasn't about the snow weight. Um, and you mentioned Arborvita specifically and something that you've run into. Yeah. I, you know, I, ha I have an Ar Arborvita hedge and you know, a lot of times I usually keep mine pruned at the top and I prune the side. So it's a little bit tighter, but you know, a lot of times you'll see, you know, where they've just left to their own devices, you know, they've just grown straight up. But you get these really long, you know, the shoots of the arborvitae growing straight up. But it gets that weight, right? And they will drop all the way down to the ground. Is there, you know, leading up, you know, anticipation of a snow? Is it good to kind of wrap around like that. a twine and kind yeah, of tie, mine, tie them up to prevent yeah, them from falling? Yeah, down? mine. Um, I've got a big long one hedge and back, and I've it's been tied up several times mm. over the years. Yeah. Um, and then I had about six or eight feet taken off the top. Um, but they did such a good job because they didn't make it show. They took more things out of the middle and left just a little bit at the top. So it didn't look like it had been butchered. Right, book, yeah. uh, and, uh, but yes, that's, that's the only thing I found. I'm short of putting in a new hedge. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> darn. Um, so, and we also, we had talked about lawns and frosty weather. Um, not good to tread on lawns. Well, if you've got frost uh, where the lawn itself is frozen and you can feel it when you step yeah. on it, it doesn't help it uh, to br break off the top of the grass. Um, it can it can recover from it, but there's no no real reason to be walking on it very much. Yeah. What if I want to make a snowman? <laughs> <laughs> then that's why I just mow what's green. I'm not really too worried about the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I could build a lot of snowmen. <laughs> go to your neighbor's house right. and you... But, but I have seen lawns, you know, to oh, the point yeah. that yeah. you know, it was frozen and icy. Somebody's walked across it. Yeah. And then later... Then you see the trail. Yeah. Later yeah. you have kind of brown footprints. Yeah. 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 That's it probably compacts then done it. Some, some damage and sure. snapped off the blades of grass. Sure, right yeah. it so does. Much, yeah. It does. And then the other thing that happens, it does damage the grass. And then in the spring when things are coming back and it's sort of not in very good shape, that's where your weed seeds are going to come up. Ooh, Ooh. yeah. When, you, uh, when you've damaged some of the parts. Mm. I have to chuckle though, the other day it snowed here. And there were little girls across the street that were out there playing on the lawn. And, but it wasn't that cold, really. Yeah. But they got their sled out, and we had at least an eighth of an inch <laughs> of snow. We really don't get a lot of girls. snow here. <laughs> Below 500 feet in the sure. Portland area. So. Um, what, do you, what else do you have, Judy? Oh, you know what? We had talked um, off camera about landscape design during winter. We are stuck in our house, and we look outside our windows, 
and there's not anything really pretty, so maybe we should make note of that. <laughs> In the years that I designed a lot of landscapes, um, I would always have the customer go in the house and look out the windows that they look out the most in the wintertime. What do you want to see? So if you, if you go out in your yard and you plant something, but you go inside and you can't even see it, it's not going to do you any good. So an example would be a Sasanqua camellia, a winter blooming camellia, right. is right in front of my kitchen window. And so I have a Yuletide, which is a red with a yellow center. And I love that. Um, and also, there's another way to think too. If you have a large yard, people want to go to the edge and landscape it and have this humongous landscape. But you don't have to do that. Go out with a shovel or a broom handle or whatever and decide where you want your eye to stop. So maybe it's only 50 feet out there instead of 200 feet. So you can landscape closer to your house and put those things that you can see out of your winter windows or next to your driveway where you get in and out of the car or places where you're going to see the winter blooming things. As you mentioned before, I think in one of the stories, it's a picture frame. So sure. you're right. using your window as a picture frame and now you paint with plants. Right, so, right, exactly. You know, I even notice that with you know, fragrant plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so if plant, you know, like especially in the early spring, you have like some Daphne's and Sarcococcus and things like that. Is making sure that those are planted in areas where you're going to be able to right. smell them. Smell them, sure. You know, when you're getting sure. out of your car, or right. walking up your walkway, or it's like the Mahonia we were talking mm -hmm. about. I can see out of the bathroom and out of the office window, and it's at this time of year, it's really nice to see something blooming yellow. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it's not in the back 40 right. where you're not going to be. In the right. Wintertime. Right. So, you know, if you've got an acre or, <laughs> or you've got a 75 foot landscape, um, you don't have to do the whole thing. You can right. have other things behind uh, where you want to stop your eye. Cool. But we had talked earlier too about welcoming birds into your yard. One thing that's not welcome are insects into our houses. <laughs> and that's what happens when it gets cold is they start coming in. So sure. um, what kind of things are people seeing right now or what can they see? Because um, I've seen a few things in our house. So. <laughs> well, it's a little, well, stink bugs are one. Yeah. They, uh, they're pretty slow even in the house. <laughs> so I just talk to them and say, you're going out where it's really going. Yeah, right. Uh, but also, it's the, the season has pretty much passed unless we get a real sunny winter day. Uh, for box elder bugs, you'll see those come in. Ladybugs, Asian ladybugs, will come in the house as well. Uh, you know, we start seeing spiders inside in September, or October, even, um, and you know they're just coming in like we are uh, to stay warmer. Uh, so there's not a lot of things that you can do other than, to me, vacuum them up and dump them outside. Yeah, and most of them, they don't do any harm. No. They just, yeah. they leave little no. poop stains everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Here, so. But yeah. you um, had an ant, so we, yeah, we do keep a, a clean house here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, during that last segment, you found an ant on your arm. I did. There was yeah. a carpenter ant yeah. saying hello. And we have those kitchen ants that come in, especially after a rain, it seems to dry mm. them in because yeah. they're escaping the moisture. Um, but um, pantry moths as well. So not the, so much in the dead of winter, but sometimes. They can be an issue pretty much year round, but um, the Indian meal moth is the one you're gonna see the most. And there is a very, very effective pheromone trap that you can get. It's a little teepee and inside it's sticky. And in that, uh, in that trap, you put this little piece of pheromone that only attracts the male moth. And you put that in your cupboard with dry goods, beans, rice, cereal, dog food, bird food, walnut, nuts. They love nuts. Um, and, and pretty soon you'll start seeing that whole thing just stuck with moss. So what you're doing, you're not, you're not killing anything with spray in, in where you have foodstuffs, uh, but you are disrupting the cycle of having more. Yeah, and if you have indoor plants, white fly seems yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, so that can happen. I know you are the yeah, indoor plant buyer for Al's Garden and Home. 
that's something you have to deal with in the in the nurseries, correct? Oh, for sure. And really, this time of year, um, you should be looking at your plants more because uh, you're bringing them sometimes from outside in, or you're buying a new plant, or it's just the warm of the heat. The heat in the house will kind of um, make uh, dormant things hatch. So you should always be looking at your house plants and cleaning them and just kind of um, just scoping for them, and then just just taking care of them how you should take care of them. Well, the fungus gnats are the ones oh, that yeah. you see the most in the winter, at least I do, in the winter. Um, and people think they're a black aphid, when indeed mm. it's not an aphid in December. <clears throat> um, it's a fungus gnat. And they're on the soil surface of houseplants that get watered too much. It takes a lot of moisture for a fungus gnat. So what I, I always do, a lot of times I say, well, that house, that plant's in the bathroom, isn't it? And it's like, yep. <laughs> um, and what you can do is just take off the top inch of soil on that house plant and replace it with new, and you've gotten rid of all the eggs yeah. from the fungus gnats. Yeah. And you can do that. We talk about doing that in the fall when you bring it in, but right. you can do sure. that anytime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and you're disturbing them too. Yeah, yeah, so we were talking too earlier about um, mulch, and, is, and the winter time is a good time to mulch. Um, what about wood ash? Because a lot of people burn fires and heat either through wood stoves or fireplaces. Um, what's the rule on wood ash and how good is that for your garden and spreading? Depending on what you put it on because anything that likes an acid soil is not going to like wood ash because it's going to change the pH of the soil. Mm. So a, a vegetable garden can take more uh, more pH to raise the pH because usually it's around 6 and our soil is around 4 or 5. Um, but uh, you can use it, just don't use it on the evergreen, acid-loving plants. You can even put it on a lawn where, you know, you're putting calcium on a lawn. And uh, so the, you just have to be careful of what you're putting it on because you're going to fry some things with wood ash. Okay. Well, it's like it anything that you add, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you should be careful. Anything fresh. Could you put it just in the compost and then it would break down? Yeah, as long as you really turn that compost and you don't have a, a clod of something that's right, going to change true. your soil pH. Yeah. So uh, I, might, I might use it um, and, and mix it separately with soil and just stir it up every once in a while and then put it on something mm. else that, that would diminish the effect it's going to have. Yeah. Similar to if you had coffee grounds and yeah, stuff. Yeah, that that's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Everybody's coffee always grounds saying just coffee. add organic matter. Yeah. yeah. Everything in moderation. It is, it is true. It is true. Yeah. So, uh, what else do we have uh, oh, on the list? Well, we yeah, were you, know, we're, you were talking a little bit about you know as you're you know <clears throat> evaluating. You know, we're always evaluating our yard. You know, and looking out and finding finding the bare spots. But you know, we're also inside a lot, and we're we're starting to get you know catalogs <laughs> and magazines coming. You know, this time of year That's to so entice yeah. us to be <laughs> to be outside. Now is a great time to be doing homework, right? Where you're sitting in well, front of your fire. <laughs> most of us crazy gardeners have on the list of many catalogs. So they start coming. Actually, I got my first one the other day. This is early December. Um, and they come all the way through December and January and maybe early February. And then you lay them out and you go. But what I have, I have a drawer in the kitchen that I keep seeds that I got, like I got some Cobea scandens, which is a cup and saucer vine flower that I'm going to use next year, and I put it in that drawer so I'll know where it is and it's dry <laughs> and not wet. But I also put notes to myself that I won't remember and if I just think I will. <laughs> um, so do I really need... I, I tried rutabagas once. I like rutabagas, but not the effort it takes right. to take it. Or that or, many sometimes. Yeah, right. um, what do I like the most? I, I like tomatillos the most. They grow in tomatoes and things, that, and things that I've planted year after year just because I always have. I'm trying not to do that right. so much. Uh, so what was successful, what wasn't, make notes to yourself so that when you see these beautiful catalogs with all those <laughs> colored right. pictures. Yeah. It's like, oh, I got to do rainbow carrots this year, you know? Right. So um, it's just a fun thing. It's a fun thing to do. What you can do, what I do with some other catalogs too sometimes, I'll fill it out 
but I won't send it in. And oh. I think about it for a while <laughs> right. so that I don't just end up with a whole lot of right. stuff I can't Does use. Does it fill that and, need? <laughs> yeah. and, but there's so many seeds in a packet. Yeah. Right. If you for can sure. share them with somebody else, that's a good idea. But because th then what? Right, right. right. I yeah. planted what I needed to plant. And then you guys were out there, I think. I asked my grandson, who's 20, to plant the onion sets. And he planted the whole bag at one oh. time <laughs> in a spot that was just half the size of this table. But I used them. I right. tried. Yeah. And that's where the garlic is now. So oh, I cleaned it so out. Funny. So you're talking, too, the, what, by using garlic, you rotate your crops. And now's a good time to kind of actually pencil out, what, while the memory's still oh. fresh, what you did this past year right. mm -hmm. during the winter and right. before you order those seeds. Right. So um, are you yeah. doing any changes? Because we noticed our zucchini didn't do as well Mine did year. better this year. Really? It, well, I overplant. <laughs> and I'm terrible at thinning. Because you have a lot of seeds. It's like I, I babied you from the beginning, and I can't pull you out of there now that these carrots are like, like this. So it's thinning. It's, yeah. it's the right care yeah. uh, that makes it more successful. So the zucchini, I promised myself I wouldn't grow as much, uh, <laughs> but I traveled a lot this fall, so um, I didn't harvest as much right. as I wow. thought I would, but and it's just, it's always a crapshoot yeah. to, to decide what you're going to do the next year, and, and uh, tomatoes weren't the best for me this year. Oh, it was a bad well, spring. It was a late, late, spring. late yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it was a late fall, trying to get them to come oh, on, yeah. I planted you late, <clears throat> and now you've got to, you know, mm -hmm. ripen. And that brings up a good point about uh, planting is um, we got here in the Pacific Northwest, we had a very wet spring in 2022, and now we're going to 2023, and a lot of people will want to get started early. And if you had gotten started early with your tomatoes in March and April of last year, they would have been gone or, or like 20 yeah. feet tall before you even got them in the ground. Um, when is a good time to start worrying about the spring garden? when you're sitting here in the winter? <laughs> it, it's different every year. I mean, it really is. And to me, I mean, it used to be when we all took a big tiller and made a huge vegetable garden, you know, it used to be you take the soil and wad it up in a ball and you drop it, and if it breaks, the soil's ready to till. Um, and if it doesn't, it's yeah. too wet. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, what do you do? This compacting the soil that you put in a raised bed isn't the same. <laughs> right. um, so you really have to wing it every year. Just don't, if you want to put tomatoes out in April, um, make sure they have hot caps on them or some other way of protecting walls of water or something. Uh, to protect them, and that may or may not work based on what this yeah, next spring is going to be. So I didn't plant till July, June 24th this last year, which is later, than, two days later than I've ever <laughs> planted. That's late. Yeah. But it was late, mm -hmm. and so it, it. But if I'd done it any sooner, it was slop in the garden. So. But cold crops. Yeah, well, um, right. So the broccolis. Mm -hmm. Right, the, um, they did fine. Yeah, you can yeah. put those in Lettuce, early. Lettuce, potatoes, onions, all sorts of things. So if you get antsy, there yeah. are some options. That is true. Just, yeah. Yeah. That is true. You get that fix then, that early yeah. fix. Because yeah. after Christmas, it's like, oh, now what do I do? You know, you're just kind of bored. <laughs> so. Yeah. But there's also the you know, <laughs> but there's also all the garden magazines that yeah. you have oh, yeah. that yeah, yeah. Sit, sitting around oh, that I you know. didn't have the time through during the summertime sure, to read sure. because you're out in the garden. But it's a great time to go sit, sure. sit and start reading through all your magazines. Yeah, you put all those little post-its on it right. and those little tabs. And also, speaking of extension publications, there's there's a what to grow in the garden. I'm trying to think yeah. of the name of it. Anyway, there's a list. Uh, uh, all areas in Oregon, when to plant what, and so w when to start seeds, when to start with plants, um, so that you get at least for the newer gardeners, you've got some idea of when you can, you can, like you can plant peas in the end of January, and yeah. right. most people think they have to wait until May. Right. No, you want but right. you don't mm -hmm. because the newer varieties that have been developed by OSU. Um, they actually, um, they actually are disease resistant and are much better planted early. Cool. Well, um, <laughs> believe it or not, we've gone 
over like 50 minutes. So <laughs> why don't we fall. make a dent in the book? <laughs> 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 one page, one and a half pages. Next year. Yeah. You're going to have to have Save your it. back, Jan. Yeah. So um, we want to thank you all for watching and tuning in today and listening. And uh, if you have access to YouTube for watching us, um, we want to thank Jan and Oregon State University, who she worked for for many years, um, for a lot of the tips and for your information and, and knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. No so, problem. Uh, thank you to Capital Subaru once again for sponsoring us. If you're in the Salem, Oregon area, you can check out their dealerships down there. Um, we will be back in the new year. I believe this is the last one for 2022. Um, we hope that you watch this again at the end of January, kind of get you through the winter. We hope this helps. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the next podcast and happy gardening. Capital Subaru, we value your time. Whether you're here for service or working with our amazing sales team, everything is right here for your convenience. We offer a great selection of Subarus, an industry-leading service center that keeps you moving, and so much more. And right now, during the Subaru Share the Love event, Subaru will donate $250 for every new Subaru vehicle sold or leased from November 17th through January 3rd. Feel great about your new Subaru and be a part of something special this holiday season. It's always your time at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway.